Welcome to today's webinar sponsored by the Office of Infectious Disease and HIV AIDS Policy. My name is Dr. Leo Moore, and I'm the Medical Director for Clinic Services at the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health and a member of the Presidential Advisory Council on HIV and AIDS. Today's webinar titled, The Updated National HIV AIDS Strategy, What's New and What's Next? A webinar on how to use the strategy is very exciting. We will hear from administration officials and a community leader about the development of the National HIV AIDS Strategy and looking forward to its implementation. Before we begin, I want to review a few housekeeping issues. Today's webinar is being recorded and a block summary of the meeting will be available on HIV.gov in the coming weeks. Due to time constraints, we will not be taking questions during today's webinar. We did solicit questions prior to this event, and we will have our guests answer questions at the end of today's session. Next slide, please. On today's webinar, we will first hear from Harold Phillips, who is the director of the White House Office of National AIDS Policy. Then we will hear from Edwin Walker. Mr. Walker is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Aging in the Administration for Community Living at the United States Department of Health and Human Services. After that, we will hear from Joe Carlisle, the Senior Advisor for Budget Policy and Programs at the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development. And last, but certainly not least in today's presentation is Ms. Daphina Ward, Executive Director of the Southern AIDS Coalition. We will then take questions and have a wrap up from Ms. Kay Hayes, the Executive Director of the Presidential Advisory Council on HIV AIDS and the Acting Director of the Office of Infectious Disease and HIV AIDS Policy in the Assistant Secretary for Health's Office at HHS. I'm happy to turn today's webinar over to Harold Phillips to give us an overview of highlights from the recently released National HIV AIDS Strategy. Harold. Thank you, Dr. Moore, and good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Uh, my name is Harold Phillips. I'm the director of the White House Office of National AIDS Policy. I'm very happy to be with you. Uh, I see that there are also several more joining us in the room today, and we're really excited to, to have you with us for this session. So next slide. So as part of today's webinar, uh, Dr. Moore went over the logistics and the agenda and we will get you out of here within the uh, hour, as well as uh, do some Q&A that came in prior to the webinar. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about our new national HIV AIDS strategy that was released on World AIDS Day. Next slide. So one of the features of this new strategy, which has us very excited, is the engagement from other departments and other programs. We've always had HHS lead uh, in the forefront of the development of the strategy, and HHS plays a key role in implementing various aspects of our national HIV response. We also have had at the table, but not represented on this slide, Indian Health Service, who has also been a partner in this work as well. The Department of Veterans Affairs has also been an ongoing partner with the national strategy and also the HIV plan. But we're also extremely excited about some of the work that VA is taking on with regard to people aging, especially our aging uh, service members, ex-service members with HIV and some really innovative and unique aspects of their work moving forward are also represented within this version of the strategy. But also thinking about, and we've talked a lot about the social determinants of health and the role they play in terms of HIV risk, as well as how they impact the health outcomes of those living with HIV. So we really are excited about partners from across the federal government, like the Department of Agriculture, Department of Education, and also more broadly, the Department of Housing and Urban Development. We've always known about the success of the HOPWA program and the key role it plays, but also having partners from across HUD and its various resources and programs that can be representative and also help us think through strategies that can be effective and reach those at risk and living with HIV. Next slide. 
Here on the slide is a revised vision uh, that is part of this new national HIV AIDS strategy. And what I will say about this strategy, it, this part of the strategy, the vision, is that it's a vision that is more people-centered. It's a vision that reflects the priorities of the administration when it comes to equity. And it speaks to whole person care and, and care across care and prevention across the lifespan. And it's an inclusive vision as well that re is reflective of the entire nation. It's also a vision that we hope others in other sectors of society, not just the government at the federal, state, and local level, but our faith-based, our academic institution, our community-based organizations, and the private sector can all see themselves within this vision and help us achieve the vision as well. Next slide. So the NHAS identifies our priority populations based on incidence, diagnosis, and viral suppression data. And so you'll see them on the slide. You'll also see within the strategy the data that reflects why these populations are so important as part of our effort to end the HIV epidemic in the United States. And these are the groups that are disproportionately impacted by HIV and the groups to which we need to focus both our research, our prevention, our care and treatment efforts. Next slide. So what's new in this uh, strategy in terms of modifications? It recognizes racism as a public health threat. It strengthens our emphasis uh, that was started previously, but we it, there's more of an enhanced uh, effort to address the syndemics, and not only the syndemic of HIV, viral hepatitis, and sexually transmitted infections, but also the role that substance use and mental health disorders play in sometimes fueling uh, our rates of infectious disease, as well as putting those at, at risk. The, importance of role, the important role of harm reduction programs and syringe services programs. When we look at the data, one of the groups where we recognize that we must do uh, more work is people who inject drugs. We're seeing uh, our HIV incidence increase uh, and looking at the data from the years 2015 to 2019. And so that means we're going in the wrong direction. And there are a lot of factors that are contributing to this, both the ongoing opioid crisis, uh, increased injection meth use by MSM, and also the fact that access to syringe services programs and harm reduction has been very limited. Also, some of our more successful syringe services programs are becoming victim to um, the winds of change that involve uh, misinformation and misunderstanding about those programs and a lack of understanding about how they are gateways to both prevention and care and treatment, and that it's not just about passing out syringes with these programs. So we need to do more education on that. The strategy also talks about the important role of the Affordable Care Act in our HIV response, and an added focus on the needs of the growing population of people aging with HIV, as well as quality of life. These are things that we've also heard from the community, and they are reflected within this strategy. Also, a call for us to focus on our priority populations and geographic areas of the country that are disproportionately impacted. Next slide. So continuing with modifications, uh, we're also enhancing the call for engagement of people with lived experience in all air aspects of our HIV national response. Uh, and, uh, and also there are populations where we don't have the national surveillance data or the incidence uh, is not, incidence and viral suppression doesn't lead to uh, disparities, but these populations that are mentioned within the plan have unique circumstances that we must continue to work toward understanding and adjusting our service delivery systems for prevention, testing, and treatment to address the needs of these specific populations that are mentioned in the plan. Also, with this plan, HIV research is woven more throughout with an emphasis on the continuing work for both vaccine and a cure. Also, uh, the plan encourages the reform of state HIV criminal 
criminalization laws to help ensure that they follow the science of the HIV transmission. Also, continuing our innovations through COVID that we've experienced through COVID-19, an expanded focus on social determinants of health, and then finally engaging the private sector as well. Next slide. So the strategy, as I have told folks, it is a detailed document, close to 100 pages, that includes 21 objectives, 78 strategies. It also outlines not only our vision that I talked about, but also our goals. What's not here are action steps. And those action steps will be developed by the federal partners early in 2022 that will align with both the strategy and help move us forward in our goals. In addition to the strategy itself, you can also find on HIV.gov uh, the two-page summary of what's new in the strategy, as well as a strategy at a glance that gives you some insight into the goals and some of the indicators as well. Next slide. So like I said, implementation will begin early in 2022. We'll work with our federal partners on a federal implementation plan. Uh, and those implementation plans, we hope will align both with the STI plan and the viral hepatitis plan, which have all implementation plans, which have already been developed. Uh, we'll continue to work uh, across different partners in different sectors. And um, my office, ONAP, will work with Pacha as we seek to engage the private sector in this overall effort. Next slide. And so with that, I will turn it over to Deputy Assistant Secretary Edmund Walker. Thank you. Thank you, Harold. That's, that's great. We are so excited at the Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, where I work, because of the inclusive, uh, the, the fact that older people with HIV were included as a focal area. It's something we've been thinking needed to be done and so pleased to see this version include that. Aaron, we can go to the next slide. Thank you. So to begin with, let's talk a little bit about HIV prevention in older adults. We, uh, we know that 17% of new HIV diagnoses are among people 50 years of age and older. And this number has been declining over the years, but we still believe it's far, far too high. Uh, according to the CDC, older adults are more likely to have late stage HIV at the time of diagnosis, which may actually put them at risk for more immune system damage and they have the longest diagnosis delay of any age group. Um, and finally, older adults may have additional challenges getting tested uh, and with regard to diagnosis and care, including fewer conversations about HIV with their healthcare providers. And this is caused by a variety of factors, including outdated beliefs around older adults' sexual activity. As I've said many times, there are lots of people who just don't think older people have sex, and we know that's just not the case. Uh, so we can go to the next slide. Um, over half of people living with HIV are over 50 and older, and the number is growing. Uh, this is, um, you know, the availability of successful antiretroviral treatment is, is increasing lifespans, and that's just a wonderful thing, but it really also presents a number of challenges. And I, I want to outline uh, three that are here on the slide. The first is a set of distinct clinical needs where older adults with HIV have an increased risk of comorbidities, including things like cancer or neurological disorders. They exhibit, uh, for instance, geriatric related conditions earlier than their HIV negative peers. And research finds that older people with HIV have significantly higher rates of depression and anxiety and substance misuse. The second area, the dis second distinct social, this second challenge actually is the distinct social needs that exist. And they result from the pervasive stigma and the lack of knowledge surrounding HIV, which can really lead to uh, feelings of isolation. And we know of the impact of isolation on the health of older individuals. Um, 
the 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 increased burden of ageism uh, on top of racism and homophobia and transphobia, for example, for example, uh, is a is a challenge, and the trauma of long term survivors su surrounding the early days of the epidemic prior to antiretroviral treatment when the disease was deemed to be fatal, and many community members died, and survivors were were ostracized quite often. Um, there's also the potential lack of natural supports for this population, such as the lack of children or extended family members. And finally, there's the HIV competence services and a service disconnect because let's, as an example, are, are geriatricians really prepared to meet the needs of people with HIV? And conversely, are infectious disease doctors prepared to meet the needs of older adults. Next slide. Wanted to talk just a little bit about the work that ACL has been doing uh, with regard to a aging and HIV. And uh, we're really focused on collaborations. And the best example we have is with our sister agency, the Health Resources and Services Administration, particularly with their Ryan White HIV AIDS Bureau, where they are also targeting older individuals uh, with HIV. And, and so what we've done there is we've collaborated with them. We really wanted to bring our respective networks together. And so we've set up a series of training webinars for the respective networks in the aging field and in the Ryan White field. And we have started holding those um, webinars for purposes of building relationships among the various network partners so that they can effectively at the state and at the local level serve people who are aging with HIV. Uh, we at the Administration for Community Living have already presented our network to the uh, Ryan White Network. And uh, in the upcoming months, we're looking at January or early February, we will be hearing from the HRSA HIV Ryan White HIV AIDS Bureau as they present to the Aging Services Network. And it's really so that they can connect and, and learn who they are within their respective communities, share resources, share information, share best practices. And so we're just thrilled about that. Another key collaboration is that we were a steering committee member with regard to the development of the White House National HIV AIDS Strategic Plan, which Carol, thank you for releasing on World AIDS Day. And, you know, uh, ACL provided input on, on the coordinated federal response to, to ending H, the HIV, HIV epidemic and to ensure that older adults were included. And uh, as I said before, we're so pleased that that, that was the case. Uh, and third, we have been actively participating in the Federal HIV AIDS Web Council and there, it's a regular convening of federal communications and subject matter experts throughout government, all focused on improving the delivery of HIV and AIDS prevention, testing, and treatment messages and services through a variety of new media. Next slide. An additional thing that we've done at the Administration for Community Living Administration on Aging is we fund uh, 56 states and territories with regard to providing services under the Older Americans Act, services that are designed to support the needs of older individuals in the community. The design is, and the purpose is to enhance their quality of life, enhance their health, uh, help them to remain independent, to live with dignity, and, um, while all older people over the age of 60 are eligible to participate, the programs are targeted to those in greatest social and economic need. What we've done in our new state plan guidance that we issued on August, 20, in August of this year is that we clearly cl we clarify that the definition of greatest social need included individuals who were LGBT, as well as old, older individuals who have HIV. And so our programs at the state and local level will now be required in their state plans to tell us how they are going to specifically conduct outreach and target their services to those populations as part of 
meeting the goals of the Older Americans Act to, to address those in greatest social and economic need. It's going to encourage states to take this broad approach uh, to ensuring services are reaching those older individuals. And this was in line with the, the executive order issued by President Biden, which specifically referenced LGBTQ+. Um, the state plans will also require, as I indicated, the ability for states to tell us how they're really going to serve individuals with HIV and AIDS. Um, <clears throat> so with that, I just wanted to give you a quick overview. I wanted to thank you again for this opportunity. And now I'm going to pass the presentation along to our colleague from HUD, Joe, Joe Carlisle. Next slide, Aaron. Uh, thank you so much, Edwin. Um, and thank you, Harold, uh, for all the work you've done on the strategy. Uh, HUD is very excited to be uh, a, an adult participant in the strategy. For, for many, many years, uh, HUD has been kind of relegated to the housing opportunities with people with AIDS program. But I think we can all agree that uh, housing is central to ending HIV and AIDS in the United States. And at the department, we, we see ourselves in, in at least four of the five goals and we are excited and uh, ready to engage uh, with our federal partners uh, to end the HIV and AIDS ep epidemic. Uh, next slide. I'd like to start here with HOPWA, Housing Opportunities for People with AIDS, uh, because it really is the department's uh, flagship HIV and AIDS program. It's the only federal program dedicated to providing uh, housing specifically to people living with HIV and AIDS. Uh, it's a it's a modest program, about four hundred and thirty million dollars, uh, and it serves about fifty thousand folks. Uh, I think all of you know uh, grantees for Hopwa in your states, your counties, your cities, your communities. Uh, this is an exciting time for the department because this is the first year uh, that the program has fully transitioned from the old formula which was based on the number of cumulative AIDS cases in a jurisdiction uh, to one that's based on the current number of HIV infections in, in a jurisdiction. Uh, we think this is a real exciting time for the program uh, because we're, we're moving to a more nimble and more responsive allocation of, of, of funds in the HOPWA program. And for years, uh, this is, this has been a, a, a five-year transition from the old formula to the new formula. So I know a lot of folks have some anxiety, uh, but uh, by and large, I, I think it's going to put the program on a more nimble footing. Uh, next slide. Uh, one of the things that we're very excited about is, the, uh, is, is looking at the programs that are across the entire Department of Housing and Urban Development and how those programs can be a full and active participant in ending HIV and AIDS in the United States. Uh, on this slide, I think you could see, uh, we have a lot of programs where there's definite connections, uh, where we serve people living with HIV and AIDS, and also serve folks who are at risk of contracting HIV. Or, and, and the numbers difference is staggering. Uh, if you if you recall in the prior slide, we talked about HOPWA providing housing assistance to about 50,000 folks. Uh, in our public housing and housing choice voucher programs, there's you know 3.4 million folks who are in those programs. Uh, in a given year, uh, homeless assistance grants for 750,000 uh, unique individuals, and our housing for the elderly program serves over 100,000. So each of those programs are multiples of the size of the HOPWA program. And we at the department believe that we need to get uh, HOPWA what it needs in terms of, of, of resourcing, as well as leveraging the resources that we get in other HUD programs um, to think about how we can leverage those funds and those programs as a platform to end HIV. I wanna talk about some, some kind of key steps that the department is taking in deepening our connections to these programs. Uh, first off, we need to start um, rolling out some education to the, the department, the cylinders of the department and our grantees about what the HIV epidemic looks like in 2021. 
I think for a lot of folks in this this space in particular, they last engaged with the, the epidemic in the 90s and maybe lost track of it. But things have changed. There are exciting advancements in, in, in medicine, uh, in prevention, that many of our tenants and otherwise assisted individuals in our programs would qualify for and benefit from. But if our service partners, our public housing authorities, and our other housing providers aren't aware of what exists in the world, uh, there's no way they're going to know to offer that to a tenant or somebody who might benefit from an intervention. Second, um, because we've really kind of kept uh, HIV and AIDS prevention treatment thinking in the department to the HOPWA office, we need to do a lot of work with our providers about stigma and uh, building trust and being trauma-informed when they, when they start dealing with the subject of HIV and AIDS. I think there's, you know, it's a, it's a emotionally expensive activity to merely ask the question, are you HIV positive, uh, to somebody who's seeking service from a public housing authority or another housing provider and not really understanding what's gonna happen with that information on the back end. And I think we need to build our capacity in this space. Um, and then one of the things that we're really excited about, and this comes out of a partnership that developed during the coronavirus response, is leveraging our connections in our, our, the number of households we have in these programs and connecting them to services in other parts of the federal government. Um, one of the great things that happened this past year uh, was a fantastic partnership between our field policy and management, public housing authorities, and the folks at HHS and CDC to use public housing as a place where you could do vaccine administration uh, for COVID, as well as referring public housing tenants to other places, federal qualified health centers, uh, where they could get services. And it's it would be a waste not to leverage this partnership that has just blossomed. And uh, we're gonna uh, keep heading forward in that endeavor to hopefully uh, bring joint forces together to end HIV and AIDS. Uh, one of the other things that I wanna talk about that kind of uh, is, a, is a unique HUD role um, when it comes to HIV and AIDS is the role that we have in fair housing uh, enforcement. Uh, as you know, uh, HIV is considered a, a disability when it comes to fair housing and this administration and Secretary of in particular are committed to vigorous enforcement of fair housing laws and, and actions. So I just wanna point that out there that we're not only service provider, but we also have a small enforcement role in this space as well. Uh, and our folks at Community Planning and Development have done a lot of work that impacts folks living with HIV and AIDS uh, with respect to access to uh, shelters uh, for transgender Americans. Next slide, please. I want to talk about two key prevention opportunities, and this really speaks to one of the priority populations that uh, Harold mentioned earlier. Um, you know, youth are a, a key demographic for us to prevent uh, transmissions, and we're excited to begin thinking through how we can uh, leverage our foster youth to independence program, which provides housing stability to youth aging out of foster care. Uh, as well as the Youth Homelessness Demonstration Program, which provides assistance to unaccompanied youth uh, up to age 25, uh, to better ingrain HIV and AIDS services into those programs and um, make sure that those programs are HIV and AIDS aware as we aim to prevent infections uh, among youth. Uh, more to come on this, this exciting development, but we're really excited to be part of this. And I thought we'd just share our enthusiasm with you all. And now to hear a community perspective on the National HIV and AIDS Strategy, I'll turn to Daphne Ward. 
Thank you so much, Joe. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Daphina Ward. I have the honor of serving as executive director of the Southern AIDS Coalition. And I am tremendously excited to be here today. Um, Southern AIDS Coalition is one of many organizations that work to collect input and insight from our communities to help to inform this strategy. And as Harold mentioned earlier, it's very exciting to see this strategy come to life in a way that is very clearly informed by the community's perspective and input and priorities. Next slide. So because I'm here to talk about community implementation and what this can look like for us as we take this nearly 100 page document, these four large goals with 21 objectives and 78 strategies and try to process this and think of what this looks like um, in the places where we live and we work. Um, and you know, my mom used to always say, and she still tells me, to work your part of the garden and focus on just that and everything will be fine. And when I first encountered the strategy and started seeing all of the various pieces, all of the opportunities and work, there is a lot of patches of soil for us to work here in this strategy. And I would encourage us as community to identify spaces, to find our patch of soil and work it and till it and nurture it in order to have transformation happen so we can meet the goals as they are laid forth. Um, and if we each do that, what a beautiful garden we'll have. This quote speaks to what we have come to see as a true reality. As COVID was mentioned earlier in the reality of that pandemic, our health is very much interwoven. And this new strategy truly speaks to the various ways that our lives come into play and issues arise that impact HIV in our communities. And so the opportunity exists for us to truly um, embrace this idea of loving accountability when we think about implementation of this strategy. And so I wanna issue a challenge to to us today as those in community doing the work, whatever that looks like, a challenge for us to push ourselves to identify um, a space, an objective, a strategy that is applicable to our own communities and work where we know that we can truly make an impact. And also for us to, to be challenged in, in, in order to be challenged so that those who have questions when community is asking for response, um, that we can push ourselves, push our decision makers to be open to the challenge of doing those things that are very necessary um, to end the HIV epidemic in this country. Next slide. First, I want to remind us that we have experience, that our communities have utilized national HIV strategic plans in the past, and that there is an opportunity here. A survey that we administered over the summer with nearly 200 Southerners showed that folks have utilized these national strategic plans for TA and training to build partnerships and for advocacy opportunities. And so we'll continue to do that in this new strategic plan. And it's also an opportunity for us to think more broadly around how we even do these three things and more. Next slide. I encourage us to ask ourselves some questions as you're looking at the plan and assessing how um, this national focus, how it can be um, overlaid through the lens of, with your own communities at a local, regional, or state level. What do private and public community partnerships look like in your community? Are funding and resources being equitably distributed to community rooted and community led efforts? And so we need to lead by convening. What does it look like to have conversations and bring folks into a space where we are expanding our table and truly addressing those things that must be addressed in order for us to um, truly have some impact and success in meeting up the goals? Applying a no wrong door approach is noted in the strategy and we also have to assess whether or not we're the wrong door and what is it that we need to change within our practices and our policies in order to address that. Engaging the communities that we support um, on the front end of things, creating space for education, feedback, the sharing of personal stories related to the strategy, hear from our communities, those who are receiving services, those living with and impacted by HIV, truly hearing and listening to how those things that are noted in the strategy are showing up in their lives, not making assumptions and presumptions about how things should be implemented without true community input, community buy-in. Um, utilizing advisory groups in a new way. 
truly creating space that is not just about getting folks to sign off on ideas, but allowing the building and development of intersectional approaches that are community driven and community led and creating mechanisms by which in order to measure progress or opportunities to improve upon how we reach goals and towards being in alignment with the strategy. Next slide. Additionally, we should look at the model that's being set forth here at the federal level and look at how we apply that in our local communities. Who needs to be brought to the table to have these conversations in order for things to move forward, in order for us to grow? How do we model implementation that actually looks at having intersectional approaches that would add shares? So not about replacing who's at the table, but about recognizing the need to bring in a true social justice lens through the folks who are actually doing the work on the ground in your community, being open to providing the education um, to your policymakers and people in your community about HIV, using a language justice approach in all of the work that we do and recognizing the necessity of creating space that is open to learning and sharing and growth in order for us to truly address the full range of issues that are addressed in the strategy. Transparency, as we're talking about looking at the indicators in the strategy and how they apply in our own communities, being transparent and how we address that. Um, and also this goes back to the accountability that I spoke of earlier. And truly challenging the um, barriers in our communities that are manifested through policy prep and pep access in your community is it just an is it an access issue because of transportation is it also an access issue because there has been um, the codification of any type of challenge the criminalization of one due to their hiv status how must those things be addressed in your communities and my final challenge would be to funders to be engaged being open to the engagement, as is noted by one of our participants in a focus group, as we were asking questions about what should be in the strategy. Funders need to be open to the challenge. Embrace the strategy as an opportunity to reframe your funding approaches, to fund emerging and community-rooted work, to fund community-led innovation in all aspects of the work that is HIV specific and also in alignment with what it will take to address and end the HIV epidemic in our communities and recognizing that there is a need for a pipeline um, for support of infrastructure and staffing and to make sure that our workforce has everything that's needed in order to effectively move this strategy forward. And recognizing that health equity is much broader than we may have thought in the past and acknowledging the various ways that inequity shows up. It is a time for us to truly embrace the fact that we have not possibly had all the answers, but that this is our opportunity to learn and to grow, that we must challenge systemic racism as it shows up in the work, opportunities to provide leadership roles to those living with and impacted by HIV, and pipelines for support um, and opportunity for those who are interested in the work and maybe somehow aligned but have not been fully integrated into our efforts. Next slide. I love this quote um, from a meeting where I heard Michelle Singer share this and feel like this is the driving force of what we should think about as we are a community of advocates and those in this work, um, healthcare providers, those living with and impacted by HIV, that we have to make this use this plan to make the invisible visible. That this plan, this strategy, unlike those in the past, truly calls in the range of things that lead to the disproportionate impact of HIV on our communities. So let's commit to using this plan to make the invisible visible and to give voice to those um, who may have been previously unable to be at the table to be a part of these conversations. Um, we may have failed to address issues in the past, and this is our opportunity and a path forward, and we are just beginning. Thank you. Um, now we will turn it over to Dr. Moore for question and answer. Awesome, thank you so much, Daphina. And thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, this is truly an exciting time in HIV prevention, treatment and care. Uh, so as Daphina mentioned, we will start with our questions. My first question is for Harold. Harold, we received a question about how the NHOS and the ending the HIV epidemic in the United States are related. How do you anticipate the NHOS being implemented both in geographic areas that receive EHE funding and in those that do not? 
Thanks, Dr. Moore. And that's a really great question. And it's a question that I frequently receive. Um, the Ending the HIV Epidemic Initiative, for those 57 jurisdictions that actually that received direct funding to engage in act, additional activities focusing on the four pillars of EHE, those are the areas of the country where we have both a disproportionate number of HIV cases, and we also uh, have those seven rural states and also the other 48 counties, including DC and San Juan, that contribute to greater than 50% of the new HIV incidents in the country. That's not to say that the rest of the country, because the rest of the country is still experiencing HIV, we still have a need to focus on priority populations in those other parts of the country. So the national strategy covers the entire country and the EHE initiative is a subset of the national strategy that is led by HHS and, and focuses on areas of the country where we have some catch up work to do. Based on the HIV incidents in those, those areas and the disproportionate impact on priority populations, we're giving those areas of the country some extra funding to do this work. But the entire nation needs to be about the business of trying to end the HIV epidemic by the year 2030. So hopefully that helps you understand a little bit about how they're related and complementary. And many of the activities in EHE, we're still funding with through our regular appropriations. And we still continue to work to ensure that we are paying attention to the rest of the country and monitoring and also responding appropriately and changing our system so that we can continue to do the work that needs to be done. Well said, Harold. Thank you. Next, we'll move on to Joe. Joe, as we all know, safe and stable housing is critical for both HIV prevention and care and treatment. So it's very exciting to see HUD at the HIV table in a way that includes HOPWA and other housing programs. I know the implementation phase will begin in early 2022, but could you talk about some of the areas you think partners on the ground should be thinking about as they're working on implementing innovative housing programs in their jurisdictions? Uh, thank you, Dr. Moore. And for everybody, I'm gonna pre-apologize because it says my network connection is unstable. So if I look janky, uh, I apologize. Um, I think there's a, a lot of work that can be done uh, in communities today around HIV, AIDS, and housing. Um, for instance, there, there are resources appropriated every year uh, for both HOPWA and other HUD programs. And I think if you don't have uh, strong linkages built uh, with those housing providers in your, your communities, uh, you, you, you might wanna introduce yourselves um, because between both the base budget year resources and the anticipated resources that are around the corner in the Build Back Better Act, um, this is this is going to be a great time for housing. I mean, it's kind of a new day in America, and I think part of it is to just um, get folks to think about being HIV aware, that folks exist in the communities, that folks need housing, that folks want housing. Uh, that's the the first first step. And then I think it's a real articulation of, of what kind of housing you need, because uh, and we have a we have a range, we have a diverse continuum of housing resources that are available from things that are just um, affordable rents all the way up to something that has a lot more supportive services. And I think an inventory of what types of housing um, you and the people you serve are looking for is really crucial. And then as we move forward towards implementation, I think we could take those ideas and those parameters and, and begin to make those a little more concrete and, and really change the trajectory of uh, the scope of housing in America. Thank you, Doctor. Great. Thanks, Joe. Now let's turn to Daphina. Daphina, as we're all aware, HIV and related stigmas play a significant role in the HIV epidemic. How do you think communities can use this new strategy to accelerate efforts to combat HIV-related stigma? That's such an important question. Thank you for that. Um, 
Leo. You know, I think that one of the things that we have to consider is the fact that so often things that are most stigmatizing, um, we may not even realizing are occurring in places where we're supposed to be providing care and services. And so I think it's truly about one, um, hearing from clients and those receiving services and providing space, as I mentioned earlier, to actually hear about those experiences and how those, and how those experiences can be doing further harm or improving someone's experience into dealing with their HIV. Um, stigma is so layered and it is, and it is so um, subjective based on one's experience and understanding that it shows up differently for everyone. So I think if organizations and entities providing services can develop best practices and standards that identify and address stigma um, and that also speak to what people need when they walk in the door. So um, how do you provide training to your staff on the front lines? How are you providing training and, and resources to those who are going out into the community and recognizing the HIV related stigma is sometimes is very much interwoven with other biases and stigma. And so the full range of what people are experiencing, utilizing this strategy is an opportunity to look at how um, change in practice and policy may also inform these indicators. And so I think it would be really smart for organizations and for community to truly take a look at existing practices to commit to making adjustments that are informed by what the where the community and where those they serve are telling them there are challenges um, and then tracking indicators of progress along with their own institutional changes and adjustments so that's where i you know i would recommend that we start but we have to address the fact that so much of the stigma that people are experiencing is institutionalized and systemic and so that we must address it at those levels in order to create standards that then will have implications for the way that individuals are engaging with those they're charged to serve. Thanks so much, Daphina. Our next question is for Edwin. I know many community partners were also quite pleased to see an enhanced focus on the needs of people aging with HIV. And I know ACL has already done some collaborative work with HRSA and others. My question for you is similar to what I asked Joe. What do you think state and local advocates and HIV service providers can be doing to provide new or enhance services for people aging with HIV? As well, thank you for that question. I'm excited about the question because it, it starts with the fact that we're also very pleased to see this enhanced focus on the needs of older people with HIV. My answer is, especially to local advocates and HIV service providers, is to coordinate and partner with our aging services network, our national aging services network, which is the array of state units on aging. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, 56 of those, 618 regional area agencies on aging and more than 20,000 local service providers who touch the lives of older people each and every day in this country. And so, um, you know, when I think about the programs we have and that we administer under the Old Americans Act, actually all of them can support and serve people with HIV. They don't all do it now, but they can. And honestly, I would say that they should. Uh, what we are beginning to see is some of them are beginning to be specifically targeted to and dedicated to people with HIV and AIDS, like our, our evidence-based self-management programs, which te teach people how to build their confidence in managing their health and in maintaining active and fulfilling lives, or our falls prevention programs where uh, people are at risk of falling and every second of every day, an older person falls. And it, it's one of the leading causes of death. And so um, in addition to, so your advocates should advocate at the local level with our service providers and with our states and area agencies to get them to focus on conducting outreach and to get them to provide services to people with HIV and AIDS. But I would also want you to share your experiences of the effective ways of reaching people who may be isolated and not aware of the need to have services and supports in our network. We also fund an array of national resource centers that are designed to provide training and technical assistance and to find best practices throughout the country so that we can replicate those 
in programs throughout the country. And they're designed to really truly meet the goals of our programs as well as the needs of our population. Um, one of our, our national resource centers in the minority area is SAGE. They are our LGBT minority resource center. And they, for instance, have an array of information on aging and HIV on their webpage. Uh, they provide trainings, they provide fact sheets and reports. And so I would want your local advocates and the HIV service providers to intersect not only with those individuals that we fund at, at, at the service provider level, but also with our national resource center so that they can share and disseminate that information as well. But again, thank you for the question. Great, thanks so much, Edwin. So the final question is for all of our participants. Uh, we'll start this question with Daphina. 2021 has been a big year. We commemorated the 40th anniversary of the first cases of HIV, President Biden held a World AIDS Day event at the White House to release the updated INHAS, and all of this was done in the context of the ongoing and evolving COVID-19 pandemic. Mm -hmm. As we look to the new year, what are each of you most looking forward to as it relates to our work within HIV and beginning to implement the INHAS? Thank you for that um, question. We have indeed been through a lot. Um, we've experienced a lot and we continue to be in the midst of dealing with a lot. And so um, it is my hope that we will take some time um, to reflect on what we've learned um, over these past 20 months of dealing with COVID and the impact of that on our ability to still provide services as it relates to the needs of those living with and impacted by HIV. It's so my hope that we can learn from that and provide the time and the space to do that as we craft our plans for effectively implementing this strategy, even at you know, local and state levels. Um, it's my hope also, you know, feeling so re-energized, all the great things that you noted that have happened, showing the administration's commitment um, to addressing HIV. It's my hope that we truly take that um, and we hold on to that energy as we go into 2022 and the implementation of this plan, um, recognizing that there are going to be a lot of challenges, that there's going to be a lot, um, a lot of discomfort as we talk about bringing in issues around racism, um, the fact that we need to effectively address the needs of all communities impacted by HIV, that we have to do a better job of centering the needs of persons who are um, persons who inject drugs, that there is discomfort and there's this chaos that happens when you're bringing you new components and new elements. So I'm really kind of excited about the mess we're going to make in doing our work better. Um, and so that is, you know, we've seen what we can survive and live through in the midst of a pandemic and continuing to move our work forward. And now we're going to have to make a mess together so that we can truly work towards reaching the goals of the strategy. I love that regarding the mess that we uh, will have to make, you know, to ultimately get to the final product, right? So thank you so much for that. Uh, we'll, we'll go to Edwin next. Great, and I'm so glad you called on me right after Daphina because I wanted to comment about her me the mess. It sounds like some good trouble to me. So uh, I'm excited about that. But I, I think I would point out three things that I'm looking forward to. First is recognition of the issues and challenges of, and for me, older people with HIV. Second is the development of strategies and plans to really address those challenges. And third is collaborative action that will really assist individuals to maintain optimal health and their ability to engage fully in their community because I'm the, with the Administration for Community Living, that's what we're about, and to engage fully in uh, living a robust life. Thanks so much, Edwin. We'll now go to Joe. I'm gonna sound like a broken record here, but uh, it's the, the collaborations that I'm most excited about. Uh, there are a lot of people in a lot of rooms together and a lot of meetings together who typically don't talk to one another. And that's uh, one of the benefits from uh, COVID-19. It's put a lot of federal partners together in the same room to think about their programs at the same time. And I think uh, leveraging that to uh, realize the strategy is, is something I'm looking forward to. Thanks, Joe. And last but not least, Harold. 
So for me, I think I'm looking forward to um, really taking a look at several things that are within the strategy and thinking about how we, which policy levers do we pull from sort of the ONAP White House perspective to help facilitate implementation. So the president on World AIDS Day talked about the need to eliminate and revise HIV criminalization laws that get in the way of our goals. So I'm looking forward to working with state and local activists who are involved in this work to figure out from the federal level, how can we help support those efforts? I'm also looking at uh, and looking forward to figuring out how do we better target federal resources to those communities most at need as part of pulling the policy levers to be able to do this work. And then finally, for, for us at this level, really uh, taking a deep dive into private sector engagement. Uh, we have some great examples, and I'm not just talking about our pharma partners who've done some work in this area, but I'm also talking about tech and communications and the commercial sector, our local businesses, uh, who also have uh, tentacles in, in the minority communities. And at a time when we're talking about equity across the nation, uh, many of those have a stake in our success as well. So how do we leverage that to help us in our overall goals? That's my 2022. Great, thanks, Harold. And thank you all so much for such amazing presentations and answers to the questions we received. It was my honor to serve as facilitator for this important conversation. To end today's webinar, I'd like to turn it to Kay Hayes. Kay? Thank you, Dr. Moore, and thank you to the panel. Just outstanding. And thanks to our participants today. OIDP is very excited to host today's webinar to really spotlight the recently released National HIV AIDS Strategy and really bring it to the community level. As we talk about 2022, I am most excited to continue our work with the OIDP team, but our partners. And you know, you hear talk about a whole of society, community, it is all of us. We definitely have to all do this together. We continue to work and to innovate and accelerate our efforts to end the HIV epidemic. We know we have the tools to end the epidemic. And we know we have the Ending the HIV AIDS Initiative and the strategy that call upon us to be re-energized. And I am by listening to this panel today and really strengthen that partnership of a whole of community, whole of society approach. I have every confidence that those participating here today and our colleagues, our partners, our communities, everyone, in this whole of government, whole of community uh, approach will be that successful. For more information about our Ending the HIV Epidemic in the US Initiative and the National Strategy and more information, I always encourage you to go to our HIV.gov website. I am increasingly energized and I have so many points here. I have, okay, the garden, um, uh, is sort of what Daphina was talking about. And for me, it really resonates on the work that we do. I thank you for participating today. I thank you for your feedback. We could not have pushed and worked any harder without the input from community partners, community leaders, and everyone on this platform today. I'm wishing you a happy and healthy and safe holiday season. And thank you for participating.